the Improve Your Self-Image video series was a way for MHP to highlight the physical transformations of some of the clients of our in-house trainers. But it was also a way for me to begin to promote several causes that had become important to me. I wanted to show how the positive mindset philosophy that I had been exposed to while shooting Oscar Arden and Kai Green was not some kind of mystical, magical, wishful thinking, but when properly put into practice could help one create a template and a direction for work towards achieving any goal in life. And I also wanted to help others avoid Joe Darney's fate by promoting a healthy lifestyle and showing exactly how that is done on a day-to-day -day basis. One of the first videos we created was about a woman named Emily, who had always been underweight all her life. Made fun of because of her chicken legs when she was younger, Emily at 50 years old was going to give herself a birthday present of the body transformation she had always wanted. You know, our lives get really caught up in you know, your day-to-day -day routines. And you know, I, I woke up one day and said, you know, there's just gonna be a little more to this than you know, you wake up, you get ready for work, you know, you get your kids are off to school, this is that. I said, you know, it's like my time now. I'm like, what do I want to do? I want to challenge myself, and this is a challenge. I posted the video on YouTube, and very soon began to notice that it was getting a lot of negative comments and thumbs down. Of course, this was the internet. By now, I was accustomed to the usual adolescent trolling and negative comments. A YouTuber named Steroids Are For Losers was notorious for flooding bodybuilding videos comments sections with dozens of negative comments at a time. Many of my videos had been attacked in this way, and so being the documentary filmmaker that I am, I reached out to Steroids Are For Losers and invited him to talk on camera about his relentless obsession with steroids and bodybuilders. I wanted to know what could drive someone to spend so much time spamming YouTube videos. It wasn't easy to track him down, but eventually, I got my answer. Soon after, he was banned from YouTube. But the comments on the Emily video were different from what I had been seeing in the past. This wasn't just the usual, almost psychotic, steroids or for losers type spamming. What I was seeing here were often intelligent, but especially vitriolic insults directed at me as a filmmaker and what was worse, at poor Emily herself. I became convinced that the video simply had found its way to the wrong place and was drawing attention from an audience for whom it was not intended. I deleted it and reposted it, expecting the negativity to stop. That only made it worse. Eventually, the source of most of the comments was traced back to a Facebook page called No Bullshit Bodybuilding. No Bullshit Bodybuilding was the creation of Ian McCarthy, a young man who was making quite a name for himself in the bodybuilding world by calling out established figureheads in the industry and disputing the tried and true methods that bodybuilders had been using for years to get big. Ian was one of a new generation of bodybuilders who felt that the old school ways of doing things, what they called bro science, was being replaced by a new real science-based approach to transforming one's body. I have no life. I take a protein shake to my girlfriend's house so that we can stop in the middle of sex and I can chug this shake. Oh, and by the way, the fact that you don't do that means that you suck. You see that person eating a pizza? That's a bad person. As if they're morally inferior because of the food they eat. It's crazy. But if you spend time around real dedicated, hardcore bodybuilders, that's the way they talk. It's stunning. I consider it a form of mental illness. I have no problem saying that. Which is why I'm really glad to see that there's this a whole shift in the zeitgeist away from that and toward bodybuilding being something you do rather than who you are. The Emily video was posted on No Bullshit Bodybuilding as an example of what not to do. The one line of the video that had aroused Ian's ire was this. It is important to eat every three hours. Most people use the excuse that they are too busy throughout the day to keep that schedule. Emily is an in-demand hairstylist, yet she is able to get her meals in when she's supposed to, because she plans ahead. Recent scientific studies had been done, which seemed to prove that meal frequency had no effect on fat loss, as old-school bro science bodybuilders had claimed it had for years, and instead often led to the development of eating disorders in some people. Ian saw the Emily video as dangerous misinformation that needed to be exposed. Linking to videos like this on No Bullshit Bodybuilding was kind of a call to arms for the New Science Battalions who then harassed the makers of these videos. 
led by Ian and others, these young men mostly, were also children of the internet age and felt no hesitation about bombing the comments section of Facebook and YouTube with rude, insulting, and often profanity-laced remarks. Sometimes so vigorously, the comments had to be disabled or the video deleted. What we were witnessing was a new generation and a new age of internet anonymity, and the Emily video was getting a huge dose of it. Once the no bullshit bodybuilding crowd had found the Emily video, it was only a matter of time before they found probably the most controversial of all my videos, Dave's Six Foods That Work video. Soon it and Dave were drawn into the fray. Food that doesn't work, which is almost everything, and food that works. Bodybuilding, more than most other activities, seems to engender a strange kind of evangelical passion in those who are its fans and participants. That is always what fascinated me about it. So many people give so much of their lives to this sport, and I wanted to document that. That's why I made Raising the Bar 1, 2, and 3 and the Kai Green videos. My brother Dave's passion for bodybuilding was best symbolized by his adherence to his own stringent pre-contest diet plan. This we documented in a now infamous clip from the first Raising the Bar. They think living is something different than an athlete thinks is living. Do you know what I mean? Live a little bit, they say. Well, you know, living a little bit means something different to everyone. To them, it means, it might mean just uh, <clears throat> food. Developed after years of experimenting on his own and his clients' bodies, the six foods, more than anything else, was quickly becoming Dave's enduring legacy in the sport. That's how you eat 82 ounces of tuna a day. Drink it. When Ian McCarthy and his followers found the video, they laid into it with an even more furious intensity than they did the Emily video. McCarthy argued that the information contained in the video was not only scientifically inaccurate, but needlessly restrictive. The bodybuilding diet that Ian promoted was the if it fits your macros method of eating for muscle gain and fat loss, abbreviated IIFYM. Simply put, IIFYM theory promotes the idea that almost any source of food was acceptable for bodybuilders, as long as one kept a close watch on how much of each macronutrient was ingested each day. In other words, the total amount of protein, fats, and carbohydrates. Those who followed IIFYM insisted that getting shredded for bodybuilding was possible if one's energy output was greater than one's input, no matter what one was eating. It had been suggested at some point that even a Pop-Tart could be bodybuilding food, as long as the daily macros were accounted for. And this soon became the rallying cry of the IIFYMers, even though it was somewhat of an oversimplification and soon became an overused cliché. Even though variations of IIFYM had been in use by bodybuilders for decades, the Six Foods That Work clip was a very personal outline for a certain type of extreme diet designed by Dave through trial and error over 25 years of competing. It was to be used only to get a competitor into the rock-hard, shredded shape necessary to win a bodybuilding contest. It was not intended for everyday use for the average person, not even for the average bodybuilder but only for those who were attempting to retain an inordinate amount of muscle while dropping as much fat as humanly possible, as in the case of upper-level national and pro competitors, and even then, only for a limited amount of time. For Ian's minions to suggest that we were prescribing this diet for everyone, all year round, was a complete misrepresentation. But nothing could stop the pummeling we were getting on YouTube. Dave himself returned fire in an essay he wrote called Bullshit Bodybuilding, which only served to stoke the ire of the trolls and did little to help the two sides come to an understanding. In an interview we did during that time, Dave was uncharacteristically agitated when the subject was brought up. It's like really, really disrespectful and they're coming up with all these theories that are trying to make it easier, which is fine if you want to be lazy, but it's the arrogance with which they put it forth, having come from doing dick yet. They haven't done shit 
and they come across with this arrogance. Like I, who have won four national titles, am an asshole, because I eat every two hours. Have you ever fucking tried it? Have you done it for 20 weeks to see what's at the other end of it, even once? Why don't you do that first, then come from a place of knowledge. And if you still think I'm an asshole, that's fine. I don't have qualifications. For one thing, I'm not old enough to have them. Given that I'm 19, I couldn't have gotten a kinesiology degree yet or an exercise science degree yet. My point is that that's not relevant. I've even met people that have doctorates in some of these fields and they make statements that we know to be false. Either, again, because they want to make money or because somehow they slipped through the education system not learning things that they should have. And I'll say, forget about me for a second. Let's evaluate the evidence on this question. So what was the evidence that Ian was referring to? Well, in the case of meal frequency, to take one specific example, there had been many studies done over the years that seemed to disprove the bro science dictum that eating more often was like stoking a furnace in your body, which produced a higher metabolism and therefore fat loss. I was directed by Ian and others to several of these studies and was disconcerted to find that even though almost all of them found little or no causal relationship between meal frequency and fat loss, the studies were, to my mind at least, fraught with problems when attempting to apply the results to high-level bodybuilding. In many cases, the sample size seemed alarmingly small and the duration of the testing much too short. The kinds of subtle effects Dave claimed frequent meals caused would take much more than a week or so to show up. It would be like studying the long-term effects of muscular hypertrophy, with only a week of working out as a test. Other scientists studied obese subjects, not highly trained athletes, or relied on somewhat less than trustworthy personal reporting from the subjects themselves. And yet even with all of the negative conclusions about meal frequency, a few of the researchers admitted to the possibility of a subtle effect in those who practiced a certain kind of dieting style regularly or in those who exercised frequently. One study mentioned a considerable effect on body composition in experimental animals, and another admitted to the benefits of increased meal frequency for weight loss that had to do with effects other than metabolism. So on the one hand, Ian was correct in saying that there was no scientific evidence for meal frequency to be altering metabolism. But it seemed that the specific, rare, and extremely difficult to attain circumstances that Dave and other upper level bodybuilders were talking about had truly never been studied. On the other hand, Dave had only anecdotal evidence for his claims. His personal experience with his own body and his clients during his years as a competitor and trainer and he really had no way of knowing if indeed metabolism was changing or if there were some other factor at work that made it seem as if meal frequency had an effect. I was unconvinced by the data either way, but that's not what interested me about this debate. Both sides were clearly clinging to a paradigm that suited their needs and reinforced their already existing belief structure. Dave certainly had his reputation as a trainer at stake, and Ian, well, I began to discover another impetus behind his crusade. As a teen, Ian McCarthy suffered from anorexia nervosa and became dangerously thin. Discovering bodybuilding literally saved his life. I lived in Paris, we didn't have a car, you have to walk everywhere, and I was very active anyway. There is a bicycle track at which professional cyclists train. So I cycled so much, I eventually got good enough to, to train with the professionals. They, you know, these big packs of cyclists, a hundred of them. And I would do that for hours and hours a day. This was before I was anorexic, so I was just so, I was almost emaciated to start. So I didn't have to lose very much weight for, to be dying. My French doctor said, you are eating as much as a runway model while training as much as an Olympic athlete. And she said, if you continue to do this, it will kill you. Applying the lessons of bodybuilding learned from internet gurus transformed Ian's physique and instilled in him a newfound passion for health and fitness. At the same time, he began to become appalled at the amount of misinformation he encountered when researching some of the more outlandish claims he saw being made by respected fitness experts. It, it isn't about identifying people you like and just taking on faith whatever they say. 
This is the great thing about science is it doesn't have dogma and leaders. I don't believe in Darwinian theory because Richard Dawkins looks smart. Someone makes a living off of lying to people, lying to children in this case, for the most part. We're talking about 13 to 16, 18 year old kids that are getting into lifting. Those are the people that know the least. They're the easiest to rip off. They're the ones that they're really making money off of. Um, that just makes me want to throw up. I mean, that, it really, really disgusts me. There are people that have permanent hormonal problems because of bodybuilding. I'm lucky that I managed to pull off being anorexic and, um, and I have no lasting health problems. I think the worst that might have happened is that I stunted my growth slightly because that was right when I should have been growing the most and I didn't because I wasn't eating anything. The, the irony is it's the health and fitness industry. Just, and and it has nothing to do with health and fitness. It's all about making enormous amounts of money off of stupid people. That's what it is to me. That's what I see. Whoever said bodybuilding is supposed to be about health, man? Since when is, is downhill skiing about health? Is football about, is the Super Bowl going to happen tonight? And all those guys running out onto the field, man, I'm going to be healthy tonight. Who, who? No, it's not about health. It's about winning. It's a sport. How can we lose sight with that? We don't lose sight with any other sport, but we don't think about that when it comes to bodybuilding. They're not out there for their health. They never were. People died backstage to win a show. Just like people die in a boxing ring. It's not about that. Why are we trying to make it healthy? If you want to make recreational bodybuilding healthy, that's fine. It can be. And you certainly don't need to eat every two hours. And you certainly can call every carb the same doing that. But to, to go competitive, you got to wring yourself out of water. you got to be at 3% body fat. You have to take your body to a place that's not healthy temporarily. I'd have to say all my shows I've ever done have looked great. But was I healthy? No. I had a heart attack in 2007 because of all this, you know? So it's not, not a healthy sport, not a healthy sport. It really is. We, we, we take our bodies to that next level and take it to that extreme, literally, to try and, you know, you try and dry yourself out and try and get that hard, gnarly look. So you're like not only depleting from cars, but from water and you start doing some other things. And it's like, you know what? That's not healthy. Ian's heart may have been in the right place, but his passion was causing him to overreach and take on inappropriate targets. Comparing the kinds of things national and pro-level bodybuilders need to do in order to compete to the kind of casual bodybuilding he and his followers were pursuing was like comparing a marathon runner to someone doing a 5K for charity. But if young men and women were listening to the pros for training and diet advice, as McCarthy suggested, maybe he did have a point. The other thing which influences your metabolic rate is eating food. And if you notice, any time at the uh, end of a meal when you've, when you've eaten protein, you'll tend to get hot. When you eat meat, you'll tend to sweat afterwards. And that's a perfect example of the fact that your metabolic rate is elevated. I soon discovered that many of the IIFYM crowd believed that traditional bodybuilding dieting actually created eating disorders in those who practiced it. Opinions on that claim varied, depending on who you asked. There have been people who are completely reasonable people, completely normal people who have exited out the other end with eating disorders. I, I would say yes. And even in my own experience with myself, uh, the first couple years I was into competing, I wouldn't say I had a full-blown eating disorder, but I certainly would go through the, okay, I had a cheat meal. I didn't account for it. I felt guilty afterwards. I felt bad. I wouldn't say I had an eating disorder, but I certainly could see myself heading down that road if, you know, not for the proper guidance. I think that bodybuilding has, is responsible for curing many, many individuals of, of eating disorders. The idea of eating five or six small, small meals a day, by definition, cures the eating disorder because most eating disorders are people who restrict food for long periods of time and then binge or don't eat at all. It's, it's like every three hours, you know, pretty much every three hours, as long as you're awake. Many of these people, even even men, I've worked with a lot of men uh, uh, who have developed eating disorders because of bodybuilding, um, because they eat clean. They develop orthorexia, which is a, uh, an unreasonable fear of certain foods. It's a lot, not only physically, but mentally, and it's really hard. And a lot of people just can't stay away from, you know, no matter how hard they try, uh, they're still, they'll still, they're like closet eater. They'll still have the donut 
or they'll still all of a sudden go crazy and say, I, I gotta have pancakes, I gotta have, I can't do it, I can't do it anymore. After last year's Olympia, had my one cheat meal and, and pretty much jumped right back on the diet. And what I did was uh, diet for the whole year. I ate at the same time that I do when I'm uh, pre-contest, which is like 10 to 12 weeks out, I ate at the same time in the off season. The average person, even if they're not a weight trainer, should be eating four or five small portions a day, not just loading up. And that's why we have a weight epidemic in the United States. Of course it's harder, but I want to be better. As Mr. Olympia, I got to do what it takes to get better. The, the thing about anorexia that's very interesting when you actually study it as an illness, if you can get an anorexic to eat and get their body weight up a good bit, things tend to uh, self-correct pretty quickly. The problem is with the anorexics that you just can't get them to gain that weight, can't get them, and, and they'll just stay right there and they're still going to, but once you get them back up to a reasonable body fat, get their food intake up, a lot of the disordered thinking leaves. When so much emotion is attached to food, and so many, so many people who are drawn to this industry already have eating disorders, <clears throat> or eating issues, or food issues of some kind, and they seek this industry out to kind of gain control of it and they think a list of foods will help sometimes it does sometimes a list of foods is the best thing that person can have because they just focus on what they have to eat and they actually forget about the other foods and it gives them um, accountability to the person who gave them that piece of paper you know but to many more people many many more people it, it represents disaster it really does because it creates just an obsession for the foods they can't have. I almost died. You know, my brain's telling me, oh my God, you don't want to eat that much fat a day. It's, it's fat, it's fat, it's fat. But I'm turning it into muscle in the end. To me, it, it boosted my morale because, you know, I knew I could still be thin but be healthy at the same time. You'll never hear me say you can't get progress, quote unquote, eating clean. You, you certainly can. You certainly can. Uh, because you can hit your macros eating clean, and that's fine. But typically what happens is after a contest, these people kind of go back to eating a little bit more normal, and they completely go nuts. I mean, I'm sure you've heard stories, and you've probably seen people gain 30 or 40 pounds in a few days after a show. It's totally normal for that to happen. I think people have, in life, people have... Um a feeling of being unempowered, no control over their life. And I think bodybuilding is the first thing that they encounter where they can actually control the variables of their life and actually see the results of that control. So they can control their diet, they can control their training, they can sleep more, they can get more muscle, they can get leaner, they can see the body change. And unfortunately, some guys see that as, as the end all of end alls, in other words, I've captured everything about my life. And then they forget about the, the, their heart and the, the passion and, and their spiritual aspect of, of their life because they think they finally have control. And sometimes they get obsessed with that and sometimes they can make that a negative too. They can get unhealthily involved or they can do things that might be a detriment to who they are as a person and developmentally speaking. Um, but most people use it, I think, in a positive sense. I have some control. This makes me feel very confident in life that I actually can control this universe that's around me. My anorexia, will, it will always be there in, in my brain, will always be there. I have no doubt in my mind. I will always think anorexically. It's, it's the difference between thinking it and then acting upon it. So I act upon what I was told to act upon. And that's what I learned from Dave. I'm going to be healthy. I'm going to be all right. Clearly, the debate about the merits and dangers of a traditional bodybuilding diet versus IIFYM was not going to be resolved easily, if ever. I decided the only way to come to a better understanding was to remove the internet factor, which at times seemed to be more of a barrier to reasoned communication rather than a facilitator, and have a face-to-face -face meeting, old school, if you will. I reached out to Ian the way I had done to Steroids Are For Losers and asked him to sit down with Dave in my apartment to discuss the pros and cons of IIFYM versus the bro science diet. The result was not quite what I expected. Problem officer, 